and and does it along with her live performances. Um, Some of it is shot in the middle of the night. So a lot of what we're seeing, she's tired. She's already performed at the Folie Bergere. She's already mm. been at her club. Um, so, you know, it's three in the morning and so forth. Um, and, uh, but they really, you know, the studios were newly built f for for this film. Um, so it's, it, they're trying to, you know, d give it, it, give it the best uh, because it's Josephine Baker. It's someone who's famous and that they're, they're trying to court and to capitalize on at the same time. Um, but I think there are a number of factors think, that make her famous in Paris. Part of it is that she's, um, is that the, the, I don't know how to put it, but the, the value around blackness is different, that it permits a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of, um, pleasure and playfulness and experimentation. People are thinking about jazz. They're kind of, there's a way that the French would embrace African Americans as a way of kind of um, getting out of their own thing um, it, with colonialism and uh, what they were doing in Africa and in the Caribbean. Um, so there is a there is like that element of a pawn in a larger you know a larger story, and the. And Baker was unique, and you know, and the performers around her were unique in um, in and of themselves. But they were, I mean, they were extraordinary. There's there if you can see in the, particularly I think in the that last show or the last twenty minutes or so at the theater where there's the chorus line, like that's what people are looking at. You know, they're looking at a very. Um, I don't know if rigid is the right word, but um, but people are moving in really contained ways. And then she comes out on the stage and she, you know, she's bent over, she's kicking up, their feathers, her outfit is shiny. You know, there's just a lot going on. And part of that is her aesthetic. Part of that is her, um, her aesthetic being remade in this like, colonial fantasy that she's in uh, or that she walks into. So there's just kind of a lot, I think, going on with her um, that I think, I mean, I think I agree with Mo, like you don't want to flatten it out too much and romanticize what's happening. It's a really complex, um, you know, dynamic that's going on in Paris that obviously people are benefiting from it, enjoying it. It's definitely better than lynching, uh, but that's a low bar, you know, it's, it's, de there's definitely other complex and difficult Ooh. dynamics that they're negotiating at the same time. Yeah, no. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think the fashion of the 20s was fashionable. I mean, that's Art Deco. It's Art New. I mean, yeah, that was that was the leading edge of, you know, that was modernity. Um, and she wore the best. That, like, that sequence, I, I think who said that, that, yeah, she was kind of, it is retelling her story or fictionalizing her story. Um, those sequences where she, um, She's getting fitted for shoes. She's she's choosing her dresses. Like that's that was very much you know her her life. So yeah, I actually thought the uh, outfits were uh, gorgeous, and uh, it was yeah. so good to see them uh, move, and also just to see them live. You know, not just on uh, paper. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that yeah. So often that's what we're looking at, right? Or drawings or photographs, but we're seeing them animated. And Baker too. I think we're used to seeing her either in just a short clip, twenty seconds or a two minute video or, of something, um, or a photograph. But to see her animated, her eyes, her lips, her expression, her body. She's just so like gangly, kind of, um, and. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's a very sexy, and uh, you know all of all of those things. It's kind of amazing to see her emotion. Yeah. Girl, you know there were no mixed audiences watching that in 1927. <laughs> oh, bro, <laughs> a whole lot of folks would have been shot. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's true. I don't think there were mixed audiences. That's how Jim Crow works. But I think, but I can say that the films or this film circulated with uh, race films, black independent films of the 20s. Um, and, 
and at the same time, they were kind of in between those films. I'm thinking of Oscar Micheaux, and if you guys have already screened his silent work, um, Oscar Micheaux's films, but also um, uh, the early, the kind of about to be Hollywood films like Hallelujah with Nina Mae McKinney or um, um, oh, it just went out of my head. Um, where they're all in heaven. It's a black cast musical. It'll come back to me in a second. Um, but so it played. Um, it played in New York. It went down to Baltimore, Chicago. Um, it really moved around the country in that in that kind of circuit. Yeah. So, so oh, I think. Engaged? No, Kevin and this guy isn't. Um, not that I know of. I I was interested in it showing to black audiences, um, and and how it was reported in the black press, and that was mostly in the North and Midwest. There was a premiere. She didn't come for that, but there was a um, a premiere with music with um, in in Harlem. Uh, that's a good story. Uh, question: I think she was just improvising, you know, and just doing you know what felt good, like just playing around. It, uh, I'm sure there was some structure to it, uh, but I don't think she worked with a choreographer. I think she was her own uh, artistic genius. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. and she had been, um, she performed dances that she had been performing since she was a teenager uh, in St. Louis and on the, you know, on the different circuits where she performed and in New York. Um, so you're seeing the Charleston, you're seeing the Black Bottom, you're seeing, uh, and then she makes up that, that sort of ballerina twirl. Um, the crossing of the eyes, uh, rubber legs. Um, so she has a she has kind of a repertoire of movements uh, that she establishes in her performances. And if you, when you watch her across different films, she does them uh, does them repeatedly. Uh, but they're but in par but they they both get interpret her dancing gets interpreted through uh, a kind of a colon colonialist lens. But the dancing, the, even the vernacular American dancing that she's doing has Africanist origins to it. Um, so like the bent knees um, and some of the other kind of angles that she takes, the flat uh, foot, those are all kind of coming from a much more ancient place um, than even the Charleston. What you notice the movement is very asymmetric. Yeah. And even her costumes were also asymmetric, uh, mm -hmm. sort of. Uh, bent in that sort of way. Even you look at her old photographs, it's that way. And I think she's, you know, inspired movement. She sort of uh, changed the way that we experience movement today. There was a moment and in the movie that I really dug. The, uh, the drummer, there was a baba. There was a baba drumming. And he, like, he had to have been someone that they just, from wherever they shot this movie, like he was from that place. And he was drumming and everybody else was trying to act and he was not acting. <laughs> he was just, and he was looking at Josephine like, girl, what you doing? Okay. That's like, it's right, but it's like, it's right, but it's, but it's, but you, <laughs> it was so much story in his face. He was like, all right, cause you still, you keeping time, but I know, what, I never seen nothing like this. What? <laughs> it, was, it would make me think, boy, what would, it what would it be for us to unpack it and to our, to our young pianist, like what would, if you were given the opportunity to, to score a modern version of this, like we like we we upgrade it, and then like what would your soundtrack be? Well, given the given the music that a lot of um, kids of my generation are listening to today, I I honestly can't give you a straight answer on that. Um, I will personally would score it with lots of like. I don't know, house music or something, you know, just in the disco, like stuff like that. Cause those styles developed in my city, hometown of Chicago. Um, and those are like traditional, like, I mean, for me, it's like black music, you know? So, stepping, yeah, stepper's cuts for sure. Absolutely. Stuff like that. Hmm, that one's a little tough. I didn't grow up in Chicago, so. Where'd you grow up? I grew up here. Okay, so what would you bring to it? So, see there's not really a lot of hispanic features i mean of course like they can be added like from the dances that she does if anything uh 
probably when she's dancing in that scene that you're talking about with the with the native drummer, I'd probably like, play more Caribbean, authentic music, because right. that's that's like part of my culture. I'm half Haitian, so like I could definitely see her like integrating well with that. Right, and then I, yeah, and I thought so. So hold on to that, those of you who raise funds for these things. And then I, then I just thought, watching the movie, and I just thought, these two women are tripping over this dude. Who like, I was just like, and he's not, he's not done anything exceptional. <laughs> to be like, so why are they both? Why yeah. did she shoot the dude? Like, when she was climbing a tree, I was thinking, where is she? Well, he, oh! Yeah. <laughs> what? He, he saved her. Yeah. From, he saved her from the attack right. of the... Yeah, but the group, but like you stole away, like you swam on you. The swimming, the swimming <laughs> onto the, the boat. Onto the boat. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Oh that was that was actually. Yeah, it was kind of overkill. Um, a little, a little much. Yeah, that was actually yeah. one of the that, critiques. If she had on her, she would have been sinking to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> one of the critiques of the film. Um, like the you know the the black cinephile community wrote a lot about 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 Siren of the Tropics when it came out, and one of their critiques was that <coughs> Baker's character Pepito is much too in love with this person who is making almost no effort to 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 court her at all. Um, other you know other than basic human decency <laughs> um, to you know to stop this attack, and so they really felt like she was being too servile um, to to him, especially with her be, uh, with the with this character being played by someone who was a big star. So they and they felt like the race politics got in the way of the film being what they wanted and what it might have been. And then like, but and what made the world and what made what made that world crazy? The you know again the colonizers <laughs> like 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 they but you want to get out of there because they've totally transformed uh, the world. But it also made me again as long, along with asking these young musicians and composers how they would reinterpret a modern version of this. I would love to hear women and young women like given this given this plot and go like all right r remix this <laughs> and what would be more authentic for you and then what do we have. Because again, you know, we take the title "Siren of the Tropics." So if we take the the, the mythological Sirens. origins of sirens, it's like you know, it's so you know, it veers off into the patriarchy because the siren is leading you into disaster, right? It's leading the man into disaster. So again, what would be the remix that we would leave for twenty one twenty seven? Yeah, so I don't right? think anybody would release this. Ever not again, this film, but go like, but again, but look at it and go. Let's do, let's do a modern version of like. Let's now that know what we all know now. How will we still pay homage to Josephine, or maybe not? But we would pay homage because she's the inspiration. Well, I think hmm? that's. I I honestly feel like that's what we're doing by having this conversation. Right. Um, I think we're the modern remake um, in that, like the music that you guys created and. Um, bringing all of these, your composition and the compositions together, to, and to me, kind of formed a witness for the film and a new, a new kind of presence and audience that allow the rest of us to participate in it. Um, and I think also maybe to sit with the conundrum of this star that is in a movie that is maybe not good enough for her. Um, but that is the work that she did. Um, she is the first black woman to star in a feature film, and that's a really important accomplishment. And, um, you know, I didn't do that. Did you do that? She did that, <laughs> right? I mean, she's, and she did in 1927. She stepped out and did that, and, um, and that's an important historical marker. That's a huge shift. Um, it should shift the way we think about black film. This is an African-American woman performing in France. Um, the film does travel back to the US. Some of the um, early African-American films that we celebrate by Michaud are also European in the sense that um, the, the prints were lost for many years and then found in Spain and in Belgium with 
Flemish titles with Spanish titles and actually had to be translated back. So, like, so she's really this way that uh, the appreciating the conundrum of her awesomeness in, in a not awesome movie really helps us to rethink, you know, the, the breadth of, um, of black film and, and all of our film heritage, um, but also to appreciate the risks. It's fine to be vulnerable and awesome and risk and some of it works out and some of it doesn't. I think we have to be able to sit with that. Um, is still, still um, the impact exists today in our ability to exhibit it. And that's something that we need to continue. That I think, for me personally, that's the next conversation. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk about that, mm -hmm. um, and let's bring that to light, and let's and let's make sure that distributors know that we're thinking about it and talking about it, and that it's not okay. Yeah, and I yes. actually can say a word, just a quick word on that. So it's the other Baker film, this one, Princess Tam Tam and Zuzu. Um, were all films that were, um, they were around but basically considered lost, but also no one was looking for them. Um, the prints were in France at the Cinémathèque Française and they were transferred to the George Eastman House in um, upstate New York. And Rochester, New York. in Rochester, New York. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and, um, and it was John Christ, uh, uh, Christopher Horak, an archivist, he was a younger archivist at the time, who recognized Baker, spotted Baker, and worked on the physical preservation of these films, like in the 80s. Um, and then those are the prints that Kino transferred to DVD in the 80s and that traveled around. And so there's a way in which Baker's films are still to be discovered. They're still new films. They still haven't found their audiences. Um, and the fact that this is playing here um, now is, is a debut. It's, it's an incredibly significant moment um, for us to be able to see it and for the film to, to be seen. Um, but it's the work of archivists, and that was just that one person who just worked on it, recognized it, worked on it, and helped to create its importance. And then all of us, I think, seeing it and, and working on animating appreciation for the film to continue it. Hey, that's a wonderful way for us to end the evening. Would you agree? Thank you, friends. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. <laughs>